increasingly, I mean, what tomorrow morning, West Coast time or Pacific Daily Daylight time, uh, Lyndon LaRouche is doing a webcast, an international webcast out of Washington D.C., but it'll be broadcast here at uh, or webcast here at 10 in the morning. I think we're gonna have a showing of it here, um, and this occurs at a very very interesting point you might say a kind of turning point because we have a couple of things and it, and it puts on people's plate having to understand some fundamental concepts about what it is to be human because what do we have we have a globalized financial system which you know is 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 in terms of the idea of humanity upon which it's run is an abomination it, 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 the concept of the present economic system, financial system, I should say, is that the, that you never want to discuss the nature, what it is to be human. You never want to ascribe to humanity, to human individuals, any unique quality. In fact, what you want to do is treat human beings as though they were simply animals, with pleasures things that they would like, and things they like to avoid, pain. And that somehow, human beings, when they stop thinking, when they don't, when they don't exercise thought, because that's, that's called interfering in the market. Because it, it, the idea is, what is it that you like? What is it you feel you want? Let your impulses take you to that, and the market will ascribe to it some value, which we call a price, which is its value in terms of money. And any idea that you want to have a plan for humanity, or that a human individual might say, this is what I think is better, is an interference in the market. Government regulation is an interference in the market. Protection of the well-being of the poorer members of society is an interference in the market. That all you want is for people to act like animals. And fundamentally, what does it say? People are animals. Now, this has become really a, more than a financial system. It's an ideology. Now, the interesting thing is the financial system itself is at an end. This financial system is the world's greatest historic speculative bubble. The ratio of speculative debt in the present financial system to actual output is at historic highs. I mean, it's almost impossible to calculate the debt. But one could say quadrillion dollars. That's probably a decent estimate. What is it, you know, what that is, that's a, a thousand times a billion times a thousand. It's a big number. I mean, you got to think about this. You know, it's admitted that the system has $400 trillion in notional value and derivatives. The entire productive output of the world's economy is about $45 trillion. So you have about a 10 to 1 ratio by official estimates. And it's far worse. You had the housing bubble in the United States. Half the assets of the U.S. banks are commercial and residential real estate. Now, in, in every place, this is completely overvalued. What does it mean? People can't afford to pay for the houses on normal incomes. And they can't sell the houses. Because if they sell the house at this point, the value of the housing is going down and it won't pay the mortgage. So they'll end up in debt. How did this happen? Well, people were in, in, enticed into mortgages that they couldn't afford by low interest mortgages, no down payment mortgages, which would then change over a couple you know a couple of years they would do it they reset. They reset the interest rate. Now people can't afford it anymore, so they have to sell it. but they don't have enough equity in the house such that if they sell the house, they come out without debt. Look at health care. Impossible to get decent health care. 
And what's happening in every sector, every trade union contract, every contract, is they're, they're demanding either more payment for the health care or no health care. This is a country that's supposedly the most advanced country in the world that has the 37th best health system, according to, you know, the World Health Organization. So the whole thing is going. We have nothing but permanent warfare being proposed. Warfare with Iran, the threats of war in, with Syria, confrontation with Russia. Now, basically, we've seen this before. Now, we're at, a, we're at a point where this system is gone, that if we don't do something, the United States itself will become increasingly ungovernable. Much of Europe is ungovernable today. Any of the, the less developed countries are ungovernable. The Middle East is ungovernable. And we're faced with the now, all, a, a, over the recent months, open confrontation with Russia, and China. Now, what, what LaRouche is going to address in the simplest terms, and I, I don't speak for Lynn in that sense. Lynn's going to talk tomorrow, and he, he usually has something he, unique to say. But I know this much. What he's going to address is the fact that we, have, we now have in front of us the handles upon which to expose the nature of this globalized imperial system. That this is uh, the British Empire is not located in Great Britain. It's largely a financial oligarchical system, the Venetian system. They rule by controlling finances and by a, 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 at the point of crisis, imposing some form of dictatorship, some form of imperial control, military control, control by chaos, control through wars. These are the people who gave us fascism in the 1920s and 30s. And now what, we've just, what we have is they've been running an $80 billion fund, which we know has been destabilizing the Middle East. This was a fund that was, uh, that was run through the British Aerospace Corporation in conjunction with factions in Saudi Arabia has been allied with factions in Israel and has been used to destabilize much of the Southwest Asia and North Africa. They financed parts of the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, both sides. It's very likely they've been directly involved in the destabilizations that we see today in Lebanon, in Palestine. And who knows, as we look at this, we're going to track down everything these people have been involved in. Because now we're looking to a certain extent at the beast itself. And this is occurring because the crisis is sharp enough that that's occurring. Now, at the same time, we have on the table as a concrete phenomena the possibility of a radical change in human history. Uh, you know, Lynn said recently, the end of geopolitics. Now, this, I think, is, is a much deeper point than most people take it to be, okay? Because at least for about the last 150 years, and really for most of the last 19,000 years, the dominant forms of human culture have been coastal or river the mouths of rivers, that if you look at the density of human populations, we don't have a map here, I'm going to do without the map, but if you look at the densities of human populations, it's all on the coasts of the great land masses, the coast of China. Even though China is a country with 1.3 billion people, the densest forms, the industry, transportation, uh, uh, commerce, and so forth, is all along the coast and some of the river areas. If you look at the United States, even today, a modern country, where are the populations? The East Coast, the West Coast, the Gulf Coast, and then somewhat along the Great Lakes and up and down the Mississippi. And the rest of the country is empty. Now, this is an interesting limitation on human development. 
And, of course, it has led to something strategically, which is that if you look at the way the British, uh, you know, and some Americans, like Admiral Mahon, or if you look at uh, the British uh, theoretician Admiral Fisher at the end of the 19th century, these guys, and uh, this is what Roosevelt, this is what Churchill believed. This is what people like Cecil Rhodes believed. The sea powers, which they considered to be Japan, or Great Britain, Japan, through control of sea routes by mil, uh, naval power, which in a certain well, the naval power, okay, it, you could thereby control, if you controlled the, the sea routes, you controlled trade and commerce. And you could threaten to isolate and cut off any country. What they viewed as the great threat, particularly in the 19th century, was the development of the great continental nations. Now, what were they? The United States, the best example, and Russia. And there's a lot in this to understand about the way this should work, the way somebody like Roosevelt saw it working, the way Lindsay's it working. You remember, what was the plan of the United States? The United States was meant, as John Quincy Adams understood it, as Lincoln understood it, as Washington understood it, was to become a continental nation, to develop the internal land mass of the country. The first thing they tried to do was, you know, this is what Washington was, to get into the Shenandoah Valley, up to the Ohio River Valley, and bring the Atlantic side of the country into the Great Lakes, into the Ohio River, and ultimately, as these things were looked at, into the Mississippi and across to the Pacific. Now, the ba what was the point? The point was, it, as if you developed the land masses, you could develop the resources. You could bring science and industry inland so that you could work on scientifically and process and develop the internal resources of the country. Now, there's another element to this. It's not just getting inland. It's, now, what does it require to get inland? It requires increased densities of throughput in your energy systems and in your transportation systems. Because at one level, it is harder to travel over land. It's, you have to remove obstacles. You, don't, you can't use the land itself as part of your locomotion when you're on the seas with the wind and the, and the ocean motions, you can use the flows of currents and whatnot to get places. You're not going to do that on land. First of all, the land doesn't move unless, unless it's in situations where you wouldn't want it to happen. I mean, an earthquake <laughs> might move you a few feet. Okay? But there's no flow of the land. And wind currents are much more erratic over land. Plus, there's obstacles. What do you have to do? You have to remove the obstacles. You have to flatten the obstacles. You have to be able to go around the obstacles. You have to tunnel through the obstacles. This requires an energy, a power capability, and a power capability for the transportation itself. So the development of the land masses requires an advance in scientific, in the technology at least, and in many cases in the science. Now, what else happens? You have a big advantage to land. Even if the temp even if the weather isn't that good, okay, you can build cities on land masses. You can't build cities in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So you can populate land masses. Moreover, the land masses give you different routes outside of the reach of naval powers to connect nations and peoples. So. The United States was the idea of the development of a continental nation state, republic. What was the case in Russia? Same thing. Russia is a Eurasian nation. It's European and it's Asian. But it spans Europe to, a to East Asia. Now, there's a very interesting element in this. There was, there, there was a, a figure, historically, who understood this and who worked both in, in terms of develop, who ended up being a very prominent figure in the development of the United States and who was essentially the author of modern Russia, the development of the Academy of Science, the idea of, of a, a mission for the Russian nation. 
as bridging the cultures of Europe and Asia. Uh, Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz actually was the founder of the uh, uh, Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. Now, he was dead when it was finally formed, but Peter the Great uh, took from Leibniz, actually commissioned from Leibniz, the outline of an academy, how it would work and what it would do in 1715, 1716. This was implemented in 1725. And it's quite a remarkable thing to go through. I, we did this in one discussion a while back. Okay, I won't, I won't detail this now. Now, Leibniz was also the figure who, who was brought into the United States in the middle of the 18th century and informed people like Franklin, Jefferson, and so forth in the forming of the, uh, uh, in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Now, what we're talking about today, what Lynn is, one of the things that Lynn's going to present tomorrow, and this, this destroys the idea which led to World War I and World War II, that the idea of the Anglo-Dutch imperial system is to never allow the development of nations and never allow these nations to develop their internal capabilities, their, their land masses. And, of course, the great example is Eurasia. Eurasia is 40, 35, 40 percent of the world's land mass, 60 percent of the world's population, 55, 60 percent of the world's population. If you allow these areas to be linked up, if you have continuous corridors of development, scientific and technologically, you have the ability to lift the living standards of the Chinese, Indian, and Eurasian populations. These would be the great powers in the world. They would break the power of the Anglo-Dutch. And they knew this. Because this was something that was nearly done at the end of the 19th century. They were deployed, therefore, to destroy it. And they did, largely through World War I and World War II. It's why the 20th century fundamentally was such a mess. Now we have an opportunity because there's been a significant change inside of Russia, in China. And what do they hark back to? They really think in terms of the American system. Putin has referred to Franklin Delano Roosevelt as the point at which there was a decent relationship between Russia and the United States. China, similarly, they have problems, but this is the direction they would like to go. So what LaRouche has called for is a four-nation, what he calls a four-nation solution, as the initiating force, China, India, Russia, the United States. Now this is, of course, then, then what about the United States? Well, the, the United States is still the preeminent political nation in the world. It's screwed up as hell. It may be destroyed. But because of its history, as the, as the only real republic that's ever been formed, because in fact the dollar is still the uh, currency of world trade, and world financial activity, if the United States goes, and it could, then there's very little likelihood that anybody else in the world is going to pull it together. There's, very, there's virtually not an economy in the world that's large enough to be the basis for a new international uh, tr uh, trade uh, currency, tr uh, currency of trade. So either the United States is pulled into this, which means we have to get rid of, as rapidly as possible, the existing administration. We have to impeach these people. And we can't wait. The principle has got to be stated. At this point, the beginning of an impeachment process would be a statement of principle by the population of the United States, which is what we need. Now, the question is, What's the problem with getting the United States into this? And it is, it, because in some ways, to do this, we have to address a cultural or a philosophical problem, which is not the way people think about politics in the United States. This is not about having a bunch of people, you know, uh, you know what do they look like? 
what 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 uh, who cuts John Edwards' hair and how much does it cost? You know, or is John Edwards better looking than Hillary Clinton? You know, who knows? Maybe Barack Obama is better looking than both of them. I don't know. Who's got the winning personality? Who's raised the most money? And I mean, this crew on the Republican side is enough that you could do a horror movie about it. You know, <laughs> why bother? I mean, you know, Giuliani, you know, torture them, bomb them, then then you know they, they try to outdo each other in that vein. Okay. No, you know, as as as, as Lynn was saying today. You know, why not just have a chimpanzee run for president? Let's get let's get to the core of it. Why not all these front men? You know, not all these chimpanzees dressed up as human beings. And you look at this administration. I mean, George Bush does look. He he, he could pass for a primate. <laughs> and I don't mean in religious terms. Okay. You know, there's something about his. Most of these caricatures of him do make him look like a little monkey. Actually, <laughs> he does have that. But you know, not a higher primate really. But it was higher when you were younger. Yeah right. Yeah right. So, but the interesting thing is to look at what do we have to deal with? What's the problem? What has taken us over? And really, this is in many ways this is the essence of this. Uh, this baby boomer generation. I'm not going to go into a, a big thing on that. The one thing is the, 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 the so-called boomer generation is one quarter of the American population. And it's probably 40% of the adult population. 76 million people. And you have to look at what ha how this thing was shaped. Because it's not just about uh, this psychological problem and that psychological problem. You have to look at what was what's the ideology What's the self-conception of the human individual today? And frankly, I think it's an issue for the younger generation. Because, as I've said in the past, part of the problem is this is what you were raised in. For the boomers, it was bad because this is what they adopted. But for the younger generation, I think one of the big problems is it's almost like you've never seen anything different. You're, you're not even aware of the way in which it works. And what do I mean by what is it to be human? And most people have a very hard time. In fact, for a lot of people, it's very difficult. They feel almost as though they're being imperialists if they say human beings are different than animals. This is, I guess, homo imperialism or something. Makes us homo imperialismus. See, we're, 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 we're asserting domination over the other creatures of the planet. Well, let's not worry about domination to begin with. We have a, a, a different and superior quality. We're not the same as animals. And at this point, we're not the same as machines. We're not programmable. A computer is not going to imitate a human being. And that's not a question of, well, we don't have good enough computers. It can't happen. A digital computer will never be creative in the way a human being is creative. Now, there's a way of posing this as a somewhat phony question, because maybe someday human beings will know enough about the laws of the universe that we can create something that does what we do, but it won't be a machine. It won't be a digital device. It won't be a formal system. Now, what is it? But this is not a mystery. Human beings have the ability, and this is, this is really what Plato is, and there's a lot of confusions, I think, about Plato. The human beings have an ability to discover principles that are true about the universe as a whole even though we can never experience the whole universe. It's not as though we go out and experience the universe and then say, well, this is what my, I traveled through the universe and this is what I found. No, human beings find in the way in which the universe develops 
that they can discover the laws of that development, principles of development. And beyond that, as our knowledge expands, as we go further into the universe, into either you know, uh, the larger elements of the universe or the smaller elements of the universe, as we experience more and more of the universe, we discover increasingly what the principles are that govern that universe. From the, from the uh, uh, subatomic world to the galactic elements of the universe. And that's how, we've, that's how we've survived. That's how we've developed. Not by learning how to use a tool. You know, there's a lot of sophistical games that come up on this. You know, you, you know uh, they show you a picture of a chimpanzee picking up a nut and putting the nut in the fork in a, the roots of a tree and then, you know, hits it and boom, boom, it opens up the nut. And then they get very clever because they say, well, wait, 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 is this a culture? And you say, well, yes, because some female chimpanzees teach their daughters how to do that. And some don't. And so there's different chimpanzee cultures. I was thinking of, of getting a videotape. I couldn't find It's true. Then they say there's, there, there are chimpanzees that hunt. Of course, then, then it freaks people out because they find out the chimpanzees are not pleasant little vegetarians. <laughs> They're nasty, brutal killers, <laughs> cannibals. It's all true. Okay, they're not cute, cuddly little creatures. Neither are baboons. Neither are most of these mon monkeys that have a lot. The, the, the ones that, that are quiet and not so offensive are generally kind of evolutionary dead ends, you know, like gorillas. These are creatures that haven't really done a whole lot. They don't, even, they don't even populate that much. Or orangutans. You know, it's, high to get, it's hard to get a high density of orangutans. You, you need one male orangutan covers about, you know, 10 square kilometers. And that's about, you don't want to get another orangutan in there. They'll, they'll, it wouldn't be a pleasant situation. So, you know, this, this is not... We're not talking about, it's because when you, you see, actually what happens with that often enough is they say, you know, well, higher primates do these things. Well, then they find out that ravens learn how to use um, stones to break nuts and eggshells and things like that. And a, a raven will take, put something down on the ground, fly up high enough to drop something, so like, you know, it doesn't, you know, like a, a bombardier or something, <laughs> and... Uh, smashes whatever it is that it wants to eat. And people say, well, you see, that's tool use. But you see, that's not the same as a scientific principle. That's not the same as communicating an idea about the way the universe works as a scientific principle. That's not the discovery, as, uh, as Kepler, of gravity or other physical principles. Now, humanity exists in a totally, totally different way. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, what I want to just give is an interesting kind of fun example, well, fun, if you like these kinds, an example of the degree to which we've effectively been brainwashed into the idea that creativity doesn't exist. Or if it does, if what we call creativity exists, it's one of two kinds of things. One is, it's really reducible to non-creativity. In other words, it may look creative, but you can reduce it to a series of steps, a series of experiences, which really have no creativity in them. In other words, we, what really happened? Well, somebody came up with the idea of, let's just say, take gravity. How did that work? Well, what really happened was, we just ran it, we just experienced something over and over again. And we, gen we gave it a general name. And that name is gravity. And what is it? Well, it's the idea that objects will fall towards the center of the Earth. And we did some tests and we found that, the, that it accelerates at a certain rate. And that's the law of gravity. And we might say that over time, we developed enough generalizations and experiences 
compiled the data, and statistically we came to the following conclusion. And all you can do is take some formal logical principles which tell you how to, or, to deduce certain things from these generalizations that we've made. So there's no creativity. It may feel creative, but anything, anybody who simply took these experiences over time would come to this conclusion. Now, of course, there's another version of creativity, which is, well, creativity is just completely irrational. Creativity is what happens when you close your eyes and throw a can of paint at the wall <laughs> or something like that, right? It's creativity is when you took something that was as offensive as you could possibly think and decided you were going to do it anyway, even though it was offensive. That's creative. Or it's just the expression of whatever you felt at the moment. Now, the idea that creativity is something completely different. The idea is that the human species faces a problem that comes from its own exploration of the universe. You explore uh, things. You explore chemical events. You explore through, let's say, optical laws, more and more of the universe that you could never see before. You could never measure. And as you do that, you find that the principles that you're operating on are inadequate to explain the new events. You begin to see creatures you never saw before, or you begin to track events that you never tracked before, like radiation. And then you begin to look for what are the principles that govern this that also govern what I've experienced up to this point but requires something new. Now, at this point, there's a creative moment where the mind generates a hypothesis that builds itself on the ironies and the conflicts of these experiences. That generates new scientific principles, and ultimately it's reflected in technologies. That's how, that's how the human species has developed. Therefore, what's value in a society? What's wealth? The amount of commodities, the amount of property. Wealth in a society, and this is understood, this is a principle in the American Constitution. Wealth in a society is the ability of, to create a society in which the culture of that society generates human beings whose mission in life is to aid in uh, human society in making these kinds of discoveries. Is also to have the ability to make these discoveries, to have the, the, ex the educational background, and be able to experience enough of society to understand the powers and the technologies that exist in that society. See, one of the interesting things is, for example, if you take and you deprive a child of certain kinds of experiences. The use of electricity, of electromagnetism, the kinds of objects the child gets to play with, the kinds of powers the child sees that humanity has over the objects around it. If you deprive the child of that, you've cut him off from the most advanced or the most developed parts of the culture, of the society. So you actually need to create the circumstances in which every child has access to things that reflect the scientific and technological level. Reflect the way artistic principles have expressed the creativity of humanity. So what you need, what makes a society wealthy, it, it gives a society power is the development of the mental capabilities of increasing sections of, of its population. Now, doing that requires a larger and larger population. And that's why you want to develop the land masses, because you want more people. And more people 
at the right level of de development give you greater power. And that power gives you the ability to develop and, br and lift up other societies to a higher standard of living. But the whole idea is that the wealth in a society resides in the individual members of that population. Wealth is in the individual human being. Wealth is the, develop the ability to generate people who can contribute, who can guarantee future development. You, know, you are, are developed so that you can guarantee the ability of future generations to address future problems. Problems that you may not even know are going to come up. That the best you can do is get a general idea of what these problems might be. So in a sense, wealth in a society doesn't exist in the present. It exists in the potentials that we can leave behind for the future. It exists in what we can take from the past and give to the future. That's human identity. The individual. Because the, ind the individual has a mission which is to create that kind of society. And, you know, one of the great paradoxes is, in a sense, every creative development occurs in an individual. There's no collective creativity. Every scientific breakthrough, every great piece of art was created by one individual. Yet, there's a, the, the element of the social process is critical. Number one, it's a social process that creates the conditions under which the individual faces and solves a problem. No, human beings don't live it by themselves. They don't live, you know, do you take the average human being, throw him out somewhere by himself, he's not going to make it. We're not built that way. And then, of course, you take the human infant. The human infant takes, you know, what was that thing? It takes a village. It, you know, it takes like a whole city for most kids, you know. To really produce a, a child at the right level of development, it takes a city, not a village. And secondly, once you make a discovery, you have to communicate it to other human beings. Otherwise, it, it, it can't be used. It has no, no reality. Because the idea is acted on socially by society as a whole. Now, the point I'm going to make in a, just a kind of strange way is if you really look at the way people think about things today, and I would say if people just reflect a little bit, I'm not talking about your beliefs. I'm talking about what you think you're reacting to or have absorbed is some of the accepted outlook or the things you have to debate about in society as a whole. Almost every axiom that you're dealing with, almost every circumstance that you're dealing with, the, some of the underlying axiom is, in fact, the human individual is nothing but, at best, a sophisticated animal at best. And everything is looked at from that standpoint. Economics. Think about the idea that government is bad. Now this is almost an axiom today. In fact, but very few people will really willingly defend the view that there's something good about government. Now let's look at it. Why do we have a government? Because we have a nation state, a republic, which through a constitution to find a means of governing society, which took into account a lot of problems, including the idea that the government might be too dominating. But the government is the only way in which society as a whole gets to deliberate on the policies that are going to govern that society, however flawed that might be. Otherwise, what do we do in modern society? We give it all over, supposedly, to a market. But what does it mean to give it over to a market? 
It means that there are dominating financial forces that govern the choices that you make. There is no freedom in it. But the idea is human beings shouldn't bother to try to think because it's an illusion. And I'll, 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 I'm going to give you a, at the end a, a perfect quote on this. It's an illusion. Thinking is an artifact. We're really just creatures. We just think about what we do, and that really gets in the way, particularly when we think we can intervene in any way, shape, or form. That just screws things up. Now, I, I have an example of this, which I find, and I think, you know, I know that in the education system, this is all over the place, really. Of course, you know, most people, you ask yourself, why do we do things the way we do? Why do we look the way we do? Why do we have upright posture? Why do we walk on two legs? Why do we have an opposable thumb? You know, one of the great saws of the late 19th century by Friedrich Engels, and to a certain extent this came from people like Huxley also and so forth, was, you know, that the way human beings evolved had something to do with the opposable thumb, which we're somewhat unique about. Not completely, but, you know, we have the, there are certain characteristics of our uh, hands which give us what it's called a precision grip. This way, I'm not, this is, you know, in other words, chimpanzees, and other higher primates have an opposable thumb, but it's not quite as opposable as ours, so you don't get a real precise hold. But human beings have what they call a precision grip. We can refine the action of our hand. So the opposable thumb is what led to the brain. <laughs> now this is 19th century stuff, but it's, a lot of people still believe something like this. Okay, so here's the way it works. You know, we we got out of the trees for some reason, you know, because uh, the savannas developed. There's all, you could have all kinds of theories about that. And so all of a sudden, we, just, we started to get up on our hind legs, and, you know, there, you know it, it, this gave us an ability to see over the grass and the savanna. Actually, a lot of it now is the idea that we were, um, uh, what do you call it, scavengers. And so you wanted to see things far away, and then you could, human beings could, get over there. And the other thing is people don't realize upright posture has a certain efficiency. So human beings are capable of running long distances, much longer distances than most animals because of the combination of upright posture. Yeah. Like a human being can run 10, 12, 15 miles in a day. A horse has a hard time making that amount of ground. Now a horse can go a lot faster for a shorter distance, but a horse needs a lot of throughput, water, food, and it begins to slow down. So in the course of a day, a human being can cover a lot more territory than a lot of animals. Okay, there are other elements to it. The lung structure. Some people even think of the fact of the, uh, the shape of the back of the head is built for a certain kind of long distance running. Okay, there's all kinds of interesting studies of mechanics on this. But, it, you know, so the idea is we're, we're clever scavengers. And, but so we get upright, and our hands are freed. I'm giving you some, but this is not that much of a caricature. Uh, you know, our hands are freed, and because we've been up in the trees, we have this grip. Now, now <laughs> we begin to realize that the hands are freed, we have upright posture, and we start to use tools. Now, tools might give you, you can dig things out of bone marrow or something. We don't have big jaws. Hyenas get to bone marrow because they can crush the bone. Bone marrow is very high in protein. So, and what are you looking for? High protein. So you get access to massive amounts of protein and you have the opposable thumb, you're working on tools, the tools make you more effective and the brain begins to grow. And with that high protein throughput, the brain uses a lot of protein. And so the opposable thumb led to humanity. And of course, since Engels was a wacko kind of particular version of Marx, this was the virtues of labor. Okay? So this is the kind of idea that people have. 
Now, you have something really a, a little more sophisticated and worse in many ways in the 20th century because he, now the idea is everything has to be understood by its evolutionary value. What advantage do we get? And of course, this leads to a lot of funny discussions, but you have to realize much of the Darwinian argument for evolution, and a lot of this, boy, I tell you, this has gotten totally messed up with this argument between the religious fundamentalists and the Darwinians. This, is, this to me is a perfect example of an argument everybody thinks this is the fundamental difference. And it's, it, it's a phony choice. But the argument is you have to choose between these two. And it's the most insane argument I've ever seen in my, you know, my life. First of all, the idea, you take a fundamentalist and you make him the spokesman for a, quote, religious outlook, it's unfair to 90% of the people of the universe. The, 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 you know, the, not that many religious people, sane religious people, really had the idea that the world is, is 6,004 years old. I mean, yes, the, the, you have the creationists, but these guys are, are, are to a large extent, a paid operation. I mean, the creationists are, come out of the late 19th century. And the Pentecostalist movement, which a lot of it was, was out here, and California was one of the centers of it. But that's how late it is. Okay? A lot of people who are even biblical scholars didn't have any idea what the Bible's aging was. I mean, the Bible also says people live to be 980 years old. So what was that all about? Okay, there's a lot of mythology and so on and so forth. But a lot of religious thinkers did not stick to a strict reading that it was 6,004 years and so on and so forth. In fact, there's a very good argument that a number of people uh, like uh, Cardinal Cusa or Leibniz, who considered himself to certainly be a Christian, believed in the idea of at least the development of species or a, a development in, in the biological realm, that there was an ordering principle in the development of the relationship between biological forms. And there were people who thought about evolution well before Darwin. In other words, what's the issue? The issue was the mechanism of evolution, the survival of the fit. Uh, you know, uh, uh, ultimately, the, 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 the putting together of Darwin and Mendel. So the idea was small or uh, 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 changes over long periods of time in uh, essentially what we would call today genetic structure is how evolution occurs. Now, then the big question becomes, of course, this is one of the great conundrums because then the issue is, well, the survival of the fit. In other words, if you survived, you were fit. Therefore, you sort of read back and try to figure out what made this kind of adaptation fit. And everything is explainable. Because since you're here, it must be the case that you got the attributes that you had because they worked. In some, and, and they worked in some. They gave you some advantage, some short-term survival advantage. And then, therefore, your genetic endowment was passed on to the next generation and the next generation. And that's how evolution occurs. And everything has to be explained that way. Now, this, one of the, 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 there's an interesting article that I picked up in the New York Times, which is a whole thing that's developed on this. And this is the last 30, 40, 50 years. Okay, because the issue is, well, how did certain, this is called evolution, cognitive science and evolution. Now, you guys run into this on the campuses all the time, people in cognitive sciences. It has nothing to do with cognition. <laughs> and that's the whole point. Now, one of the, the, the issues, God has always been a puzzle. The question is, why do police, the, the supposed question is, why do people believe in God? What's the evolutionary benefit of believing in God? And how did the belief in God come? 
And, and, and you'll, I'm going to give you a flavor of this discussion because it's kind of funny. And I, there's some interesting historical twists in it. But I think there's a punchline in this that, that is, is perfect for realizing what we're up against. And what is the point? My point is it, that is, the, the issue in the American population today is that the, the republic was built on the idea that human beings have a unique role and quality in the universe. So in religion, people call it the soul. I don't, I'm not a religious person myself. But there is something about the fact that human beings have a mind. And the mind expresses and develops ideas. And those ideas have a permanence that go beyond the physical existence of the individual. In a sense, if you communicate an idea to another human being, who survives you, then you're, you are alive in that person. Now, that's, that's something you can't explain physically. That's part of being human. That's why it's appropriate to refer to the idea of a soul or an identity. A human individual is not limited to their physical existence. A, a good way to look at this is if, is if you have made any historical, to get beyond family, if you studied an individual historically, a person who lived 200, 400, 800, 1,000 years ago, if you reflect on this, you realize that person spoke to you, even though that person has been dead for 800 years. You at least have the possibility of grasping or replicating in your mind something about the personality of that person. So it doesn't mean that there's a spiritual substance floating around or hovering over you that you can't see. Those are somewhat caricatures. There's a very real point. Is, is someone like Abraham Lincoln alive in you today? Well, that could be. He could be affecting you. He could, he could speak to you. And probably, even if you don't know it, a person like that has affected you. Has Martin Luther King affected people today? Does his I Have a Dream speech resonate in people's heads? What does it do to them when they hear it? And there are other, many other ways to, 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 to begin to comprehend some of these things, even including the idea of God, as I'll make a, a, a passing point on. Now, what do these guys do? They're supposedly talking about God and religion. And they're saying, boy, isn't it strange? Because religion, religion is counterfactual. This guy has an interesting expression. But I, um, he, he calls it a superstition a belief in hope beyond reason. Or at another point he says, religious belief requires taking what is materially false to be true and what is materially true to be false. And the question becomes, well, what could possibly be the evolutionary advantage of believing in false things? Why would we have these religious beliefs? And of course they say things like, it's not about whether or not God exists, it's, that's a matter for philosophers. But it's why do we believe it? Now, of course, this is a very strange way to put things. We might believe it because it's true. So you really can't separate it out. If there's something that allows us to discover a truth, that's not a question of its adaptability. We can presume, I think, that the truth is adaptive. Period. Huh? Huh? The truth is beneficial. Knowing the truth is, is, is of some benefit in itself. That we don't need to prove that knowing the truth is adaptive. Okay? Now, but I, I, I have to give you a sense of the way these guys think. Um, which is the better biological explanation for a belief in God? Evolutionary adaptation or neurological accident? Is there something about the cognitive functioning of humans 
that makes us receptive to belief in a supernatural deity. And if scientists are able to explain God, what then? Is explaining religion the same thing as explaining it away? And so on and so forth. In short, are we hardwired to believe in God? And if we are, how and why did that happen? In other words, they take it completely separate. There's the, evol the evolutionary standard is simply this. Does it benefit you? And in the short run, okay, does it benefit you? Can you give some direct idea of the benefit of believing in God? And that's the only way you can try to explain why people believe this. Now, the point I'm going to make to you, as you'll see, is this is not about God. This is one of these fakes. It's a feint. By talking about religion and also setting it up so that people, say, particularly, you know, a more liberal audience, well, you know, people go, through, why do they go through the rituals and what do they re really believe? I mean, how many people really believe in a guy with a long beard up in heaven somewhere? Okay. And, and what are the relations between the rituals and the belief? But they're not talking about this. What you'll see is they're talking about human ideas, the human mind. And the issue is, why does the human mind generate these strange things? What's the evolutionary value of that? Okay? It's really about human creativity or human cognition, not about God. And you'll see, I mean, I'll make, this is absolutely the case, you'll see. This is not something I'm making up, but I, I, I have to give you something funny. So what is, this is an article about one of these guys who's a cognitive scientist, and they're trying to figure out what about, what is it that, that leads us to these strange beliefs? And you can see axiomatically, they say, well, it's just strange. Maybe it's true. Maybe there is a God, but that's a whole different question. But why would we believe it? Now, i tell you something about it. Some of you who know a little bit about uh, the cultural degeneration after the war, and I tell you, this became particularly strong after World War II though it obviously it goes back further. This kind of stuff is a post-world. The, the mixing of Darwinian evolution and a, a lot of st uh, statistical, formal ideas about the human mind. And you see, they talk about modules and so on and so forth. There's a good quote here, I think. Anyway. I'll find it in a second. But the, the best part of it is this. Let me give you an idea. This, this one guy's name is Scott Atran, and he's about 57 years old or something like that. Atran intended to study mathematics when he entered Columbia as a precocious 17-year-old. But then what happened? He went to an anti-war demonstration in the late 1960s when he was, I think, 18 or something. One day in his freshman year, he found himself in an anti-war rally listening to Margaret Mead then perhaps the most famous anthropologist in America. Now, of course, Margaret Mead was a complete, uh, I mean, most of her studies have been proven to have been frauds, and she was one of the leaders of the Congress of Cultural Freedom, which was, uh, you know, was completely an attack on any idea that human beings could discover the truth. Everything was uh, relative and so on and so forth. So anyway, she's at this rally, Atran, dressed in a flamboyant Uncle Sam suit, stood up and called her a sellout for saying protesters should be writing to their congressmen instead of staging demonstrations. Young man, the unflappable Meade said, why don't you come to see me in my office? Now, there's some interesting questions to ask about that, but anyway, <laughs> and rooted in her history, actually. Okay. Um, and Atran went to go see her. He ended up working for her in the Museum of Natural History. Now, this gets even funnier. Um, he studied, it, while still an undergraduate, Atran decided to explore these questions by organizing a conference on universal aspects of culture and inviting all his intellectual heroes. The linguist Noam Chomsky, the psychologist Jean Piaget, the anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss, and Gregory Bateson, who was also Margaret Mead's ex-husband. He was also one of the people in the LSD project, MKUltra, so on and so forth and a couple of uh, French uh, biologists. It was 1974. The only site he could find for the conference was a location just outside Paris. Atran, a scraggly 22-year-old with a guitar who had learned fr his French from comic books, to his astonishment, everyone he invited agreed to come. 
So this kid, 22-year-old kid supposedly pulled together a conference of Noam Chomsky. Some of you may not recognize some of these names, but Noam Chomsky, who to this day is considered one of the intellectual leaders of the anti-war left, uh, also a guy who totally believes that human beings essentially are machines, that language comes from an internal computing device, and so on, right? Uh, uh, Claude Levi Strauss. Claude Levi Strauss, a French anthropologist who did rather uh, had a rather strange view of the structures of human society, and did uh, studies of primitive cultures, so-called in South America and so on and so forth. And his whole argument was that you know there's an internal structure to every society, and all of them are equal. And he, he, did, he, he did a study of a, a tribe that I just saw, I forget the name of them, in, in South America. Um, anyway, he, he worked out all kinds of kinship structures and uh, quiz, literally the, the, the way in which people cooked and so on and so forth. And he said, this is what you need to map a culture out. Okay, Jean Piaget is a funny, interesting character on child development, but also similar kinds of problems. Okay, so you have to ask yourself how this kid pulls this together. Margaret Mead, who knows? But this is a classic example of what happened intellectually to this generation. Because what does he begin to look at? His basic idea, along with a bunch of other guys who are mentioned here, I'm not going to go through all the details, uh, are a bunch of people who are basically trying to explain away the nature of human thought. Now, a, a, a good example of this, this is, I, I like, is, is perfect, since I'm not going to go through everything. Um, now, I'll give you two points here. Did I argue? Okay. Darwinians, let's see if I get the right thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some, they say some things that come along with, uh, with evolutionary ad adaptation are not advantageous, but there's an accidental byproduct. Okay, for example, they say the fact that we have a, uh, blood, an internal system that carries the blood, warm blooded creatures over, that's ad advantageous. The fact that the, the blood has the color red is an accident. Now, again, they think of these things in very funny ways, but this is what they're arguing. Some things are adaptive and some things are byproducts. Now, one of these guys gives this a name, spandrel. A spandrel is something that's not part of the adaptive element, but it's accidental. Stephen Jay Gould, the famous evolutionary biologist at Harvard, and his colleague Richard Lewinton proposed spandrel to describe a trait that has no adaptive value of its own. They borrowed the term from architecture, where it originally referred to V-shaped structures formed between two rounded arches. Okay, you get the idea. You take two arches together and you get a V. Now, of course, it's very interesting to me. It's not, this is a little bit of a funny idea. Because why is the V in the arch an accidental feature? It actually comes out of the fact that that's the structure that you need. If you put them together, you get V-shaped areas. But they call this an accident. Now, here's the point they're making. The belief in God might be an accidental feature of something else that's more adaptive. Now, this is where it then goes. What is it that is, might be more adaptive? Okay. Hardships of early human life favored the evolution of certain cognitive tools. So this, I think, this is where you're really going with this, right? That what is it? The belief in God and religion is an accidental feature of certain cognitive faculties. Now, th now they're supposedly talking about the human mind. And what's the characteristic of the human mind? It's only its adaptive features. Now, what is it? Hardships of early human life favored the evolution of certain cognitive tools, among them the ability to infer the presence of organisms that might do harm, to come up with causal narratives for natural events, 
and to recognize that other people have minds of their own with their own beliefs, desires, and intentions. Psychologists call these tools, respectively, agent detection, that's, re that's um, uh, inferring the presence of an organism, is agent detection, causal reasoning, the tendency to have a narrative of causal relationship amongst things, and theory of mind, that is ascribing to other things desires and so on and so forth. That's your theory of mind. Now, get where they're going with this, right? Now, how does this work? I'm going to, you know, for example, why is it useful to have agent detection as part of your cognitive package? Well, and he says this. I'm not going to quote it, but suppose you're a guy walking on the savannah, you know, a half a million years ago. Now, suppose out of the corner of your eye, the grass moves. And you ascribe to that agency. That is, it's something moving. It's not just an accident. It's adaptive because <clears throat> if you think there's something moving, you might run away from it. Now, of course, it might just be the grass rustling, but then you've lost nothing. You've just run away from the grass rustling. What if it's a hyena? The fact that you ascribed agency let you escape the hyena. So agent detection as a cognitive assumption, really, this is not anything about truth. We don't know what's there. It's just that it's beneficial to think in terms of agency. Okay? Now, I tell you something. This, some of this stuff is really just, it's so uh, arbitrary. For example, it, it, it's not clear to me that this is even right the way he poses it. For example, if you had a, if you were the kind of, creature on the savannah that was so nervous that every time the grass rustled, you ran. <laughs> You'd be running all the time. Right? You'd probably burn up a lot of energy. And you, by the way, and you can see this somewhat in, in uh, you know, prey creatures, antelopes and things like that. They're, they're like constantly on alert. It is part of the tension of being preyed upon. And there is, there is a way in which this wears at the species. Okay? So it's not at all. Then you have causal reasoning. What's causal reasoning? It's the, ability, it's the tendency to construct a narrative. Um, a second mental module that primes us for religion. And see, the idea is there's modules in the mind. and they, they, We just put these things together. I don't want to, they have quotes on it. The human brain has evolved the capacity to impose a narrative complete with chronology and cause and effect logic on whatever it encounters, no matter how apparently random. We automatically and often unconsciously look for an explanation of why things happen to us. Stuff just happens is no explanation. Gods, by virtue of their strange physical properties... So you see, basically what they're arguing is, this whole idea of God and religion is a byproduct of these strange cognitive characteristics that may have had some adaptive feature to it. So it, while they're doing this, they're reducing cognition. In fact, you're beginning to, you're going to begin to ask, well, what was the virtue of cognition? Why, why don't we just have these automatic responses? Why do we bother to think about anything? Why do we bother to come up with a causal principle? And in fact, what these guys are, you know, are uh, implicitly arguing is our tendency to do those things is what tends us to, to all these big theories and hypotheses about the universe that, you know, why have all these burdens? It's probably all untrue. And I tell you something, the thing I, uh, the reason, I, this is what most people in society today are raised on. If not this, then they're raised on the, on the, um, the, uh, the other extreme, which is, well, you know, it's all written in the Bible. And you just got to get the right interpretation. It ain't that different. You just got to get the right interpretation with all the footnotes, and you got to be able to read the contract right, like the average fundamentalist. And this is the debate in society today. This is the debate o over stem cell research. This is the debate over crea uh, you know, creationists versus science, so-called. Most science today is statistical garbage. 
This was Einstein's fight. Now, I'll give you a couple more things. I don't want this to go on forever. Um, but I found this pretty wild. Um, then he talks about the positing of other minds. Now, and, and he talks about how this is good because you begin to realize that other people think and you can put yourself in the, in the mind of your enemy and the way your enemy may think or, you know, and so on and so forth. And he calls it folk psychology. A third cognitive trip is a kind of trick is a kind of social intuition known as theory of mind. A, listen to the same. <clears throat> a third cognitive trick is a kind of social intuition known as theory of mind. We, call, we have this highfalutin idea of a theory of mind, but it's really a cognitive trick. And what is it that we do? Since the word theory suggests formality and self-consciousness, other terms have been used for the same concept, like intentional stance and social cognition. Atrian calls it folk psychology. Where? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> that looks like a biter. Wee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Friday to <Silver Island. laughs> Another victory for the higher species of the planet. <laughs> Somebody's going to report me to PETA. <laughs> All right. That was that was my agent detection system. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, so the, now we now we have the theory of mind. The process begins with the uh, positing the existence of mind, our own and others that we cannot see or feel. This leaves us open almost instinctively to the belief in the separation of the body and the mind. If you can posit minds in other people, you cannot verify empirically, uh, one guy suggests. Uh, it's a short step to positing minds that do not have to be anchored to a body. And from there, he said, it is another short step to positing an immaterial soul and a transcendent God. So you see, everything is reduced effectively to a trick. Well, we have this idea. This lets us think about what other people might think. And that has adaptive value. And then we think, oh, well, if there's a mind, it might not be part of the body, and that leads us to the soul, and that leads us to God. So uh, it, you have to realize this is not about God and religion. It's about what human beings are. It's about what the mind is. It's about what intentions are. And as I say, this is what people are taught over and over and over again. Or this is the debate that you think you're in where it's sort of some phony idea of religion, which is a cover for what supposedly, what does it say? There is no soul. Now, they can say, well, you can believe in a soul, maybe there is a soul, but you can't know it. Because the cognitive apparatus of the human individual is just there to adapt you, to essentially trick you into things that might be useful, or not. Because then there's a whole question of all the Anyway, then he goes into a whole bunch of other stuff. Some of it's kind of funny, but I'm not going to. The bottom line, according to byproduct theorists, is that children are born with a tendency to believe in omniscience, invisible minds, immaterial souls, and when they grow up in cultures that fill their minds hardwired for belief with specifics. <laughs> it's a little bit like a language. So you get an idea. This is, this is what they think of things. And this is a whole a, a school of people. Um, then they have some stuff I'm not going to bother with. It's kind of, all of it I find kind of funny. What's counterintuitive and so forth. But now I want to get to sort of the conclusion to make my point. Because then he talks about those who think that it's adaptive, which means that there's some benefit because religion b gives people rituals, and then they have the rituals, and that holds them together socially, and that can be, have a benefit. And then there's this whole debate amongst the scientists. According to some adaptationists, this is part of a religion's role to help humans deal with the grim certainty of death. Believing in God in the afterlife, they say, is how we make sense of the brevity of our time on earth 
and how we give meaning to this brutish and short existence. Religion can offer solace to the bereaved and comfort to the frightened. Again, think about what they're really talking about. What's your sense of who you are as a human being? You tell yourself a story. You try to make yourself feel better. The human mind does not produce an adequate comforting delusion against the situation of stress or fear. Indeed, any organism that was prone to such delusions would not survive long. And then he t they talk about how we can't conceive of not being alive. Uh, it might be just as impossible to si simulate the non-existence of loved ones. A large part of any relationship takes place in our mind. So it's natural for it to continue much as before, much as before after the other person's death. It's easy to forget your sister is dead when you reach for the phone to call her, since your relationship was based so much on memory and imagined conversations. In addition, our agent detection device sometimes confirms the sensation that the dead are still with us. The wind brushes our cheek, a spectral shape somehow shows up, and so on and so forth. Right? So these are all considered to be, maybe it's adaptive because it helps us feel better. But it has nothing to do with reality. It has nothing to do with the, with the nature of the human mind's ability to discover anything. Now, I'll get to the, to the, to the, to the last point since we're losing people here. Um, anyway, I'm not going to... Because I think the punchline is right here. Uh, there's uh, one of the debates as well. You know, there's, there's maybe God is there to explain gaps in our knowledge and gaps in our belief. And then um, the internal push and pull between the spiritual and the rational reflects what used to be called the God of the gaps view of religion. The presumption was that as science was able to answer more questions about the natural world. God would be invoked to answer fewer and religion would eventually recede. Research about the evolution of religion suggests otherwise. No matter how much science can explain, it seems the real gap that God fills is an emptiness that our big-brained mental architecture interprets as a yearning for the supernatural. The drive to satisfy that yearning, according to both adaptationists and byproduct theorists, might be an inevitable and eternal part of what Atran calls the tragedy of human cognition. I, I think that that's the last sentence in the, in, in, in the thing. I think that, that's, that sums up what I'm trying to get at. What really is this view? It's existentialism. In the guise of all this formal logic and formal science and uh, uh, scientific generalizations on experience and the survival of the fit. It's existentialism. It's fundamentally that human cognition is an accidental and probably maybe even counter evolutionary feature of human life that is essentially a tragedy in their mind. It's a burden. It, it makes us believe strange and unuseful things that are clearly not true. It gives us a bizarre idea about ourselves, like immortality, that we have some purpose that goes beyond our immediate existence, and that's what's adaptive about being human. The reason you can't view us as adaptive is we're adaptive in an entirely different way. The benefit of human creative uh, mental capability goes beyond the survival of the individual. It's not about keeping your DNA alive. We don't re reproduce ourselves biologically. We reproduce by reproducing society as a whole in such a fashion that it benefits the development of each and every individual. And cognition, in the right sense, is the essence of what it is to be human. It's at the core of it. This is a reduction of, co of the cognitive powers of the human being to nothing, to a series of experiences and some crazy beliefs about those experiences that's a function of being conscious. 
and consciousness is a burden. Now, essentially, my the reason I'm going is this is the the outlook. This is the type of outlook that's at the root of free trade theory, market theory, anti-government deregulation. It's at the root of the view that human beings are nothing more than machines, animals. Your monetary value. That, that, well, how much are you worth? The monetary price put on your head, basically. How much you're able to gain in the marketplace. And that's the view of humanity that we would have to change or begin the process of changing. That's what's at stake in the general welfare principle. That's fundamentally what's at stake in going back to FDR. It's a whole other story. But contrary to everything believed, all the stories about what FDR did, he did in reaction to the Depression, he was a pragmatic politician, it's not true. He was doing this when he was a governor in 1928 and 1930, before the Depression. That's reality. And effectively, what Lynn is getting at, even if you, you know, what Lynn, I just find this kind of interesting to realize, this is the way these guys think. But what Lynn is getting at is the essential question on the table is what is the nature of it to, what is the nature of human beings? What is this creativity and what does it mean to orient a principle of constitutional government to recognizing that in every one of the, in, in, in the entirety of the six and a half billion people on this planet, this principle of creative capability is what makes them human. And it's what gives each and every one of them an intrinsic value. That's what's valuable to you and I about every other human being on the planet. That's the, the irreducible difference. If you like, it's just, that's the sacred quality, whether it's political, scientific, or religious. It's sacred in the, in the precise sense that it's that quality in every human being which has the potential to be immortal, to be of fundamental contribution to all of future humanity. And what you get at the bottom of this is a deep and abiding pessimism about humanity, about what it is, not just about the, what, what, where we're headed, that we might make mistakes. It's a deep and abiding pessimism about the nature of what it is to be human. What a sentence. God fills an emptiness that our big-brained mental architecture interprets as a yearning for the supernatural. Interprets. The drive to satisfy that yearning according to both adaptationists and byproduct theorists might be an inevitable and eternal part of what Atran calls the tragedy of human cognition. I mean, you can't say it any more clearly than that. What's the existential outlook? Consciousness is eternal pain, eternal absurdity. And the only point I would make is, is you know, is is this type of thinking maybe not is is at the root of much of post World War II, all of this is what we mean by the Congress of Cultural Freedom. This is what we mean by the anti-authoritarian principle. That's what we mean by it. This is what comes up in political debates. How can you say this? How can you say that? It's just what gets by. It's just what wins. It's just what survives in the marketplace. And I'll tell you, this ain't the American Revolution. This is not Roosevelt. This is not Lincoln. It's not Washington. It's not Leibniz. It's not our allies in Europe. It's not the culture of Europe that we attempted to bring over here. It's a totally different world. And at this point, this philosophical difference is where most of the fight is. The brutality of American culture today is the idea you just assert your superiority. You just beat your enemies into submission. 
So I'll take a couple questions getting late, but. Mm -hmm. As we had some discussions, um, and because we're not referencing the question of universal physical principle, mm -hmm. can you give some insight into the. Well, I think that I always have, you know, the best way I think about these things is negatively, I must admit. You know, in other words, the way most people think about Plato's concept of ideas is um, uh, to it's some extent from a modern standpoint, but, you know, which it, it is Aristotle's view. See, one of the big things you have to understand about Plato is much of what people talk about Plato is Aristotle's interpretation of Plato. It's Aristotle, right, who, it's his lecture notes. And a lot of Aristotle is, is lecture notes, actually. But he has a set of lecture notes, supposedly, on Plato and Plato's theory of forms, <coughs> which is the standard view that you get of Plato. Now, the idea is pretty much what a, what a modern positivist, which is something to discuss at some other time, Russell or something like that, would say, well, uh, a universal is just a collection of objects which we choose to put together. Now, in, and in the extreme form, the nominalist, or in the, the Akamite, this came up, who says, well, really, it's just the name that we put on the collection. Okay? Uh, so there's, a, there's a, a, we can take uh, chairs. You know, chairs is the set of chairs in this room. That's what I'm referring to. Okay. Now, Plato says, no, there's an idea. And the idea is, well, it's, there's an idea of chairhood. And we apply that idea to these chairs. That's the standard presentation of Plato. Okay. Now, that's, that really is not Plato. See, Plato, in order to understand Plato, you have to understand there's a hierarchy of ideas. So he might admit, I'm not even sure this is but he might admit at the lowest level, you have some kind of an image of a chair, and it's related to kind of a, a, a universal concept of a chair, and you're applying that. And then this runs into certain kinds of problems and so on and so forth. Okay, But Plato really doesn't say, if you read the Parmenides, he offers all the criticisms. Everything that Aristotle says is wrong with the theory of ideas, Plato attacks in the first half of the Parmenides. He raises all of them. And he says that's not what they are. Then you get the second half, which is the Eleatics, Parmenides, who, you know, which is the, uh, you know, uh, there's one big idea and everything dissolves into the one idea. And then Plato goes through all the different problems with that. And he makes fun of it. He says it's absurd, which is why people have a problem reading it. Because he's just saying, you know, everything, if you say all is one, then you lose existence, you lose differentiation, et cetera, et cetera. You can't have sameness of difference, you can't have anything. In the first half, he's destroyed all the really simple minded ideas. And what is he, then he ends with this presumed bit of a joke. But he says, you know, it is, it both is, and it's not, and, you know, blah. And then he says in it, 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 what is it? It's a principle of change. It's a principle of development. Then if you look at things like the Timaeus or the Republic, right? what does he really say? He says that there, that there is a principle which governs the way in which all of these ideas are applied and really ultimately says it's the principle of the good. Okay? And so for Plato, each of these ideas reflects some application, some, some principle of application that ultimately goes back to an idea of, what, of the good. And what is, what is the good for Plato? The good is the comprehension of the compositional principle of the universe or principles of the universe. So it all goes that way. In other words, it's, it starts from the top. There's a principle of composition in the universe. The good is understanding what that principle of composition is. Every other idea is, a, is an application of those underlying principles, and that's how he talks about it in the Timaeus. And so really the best way to look at the principle, the, the, what, what Plato really means by ideas, because they all are physical principles, 
They're the only ones that are important of the physical principles. And he talks about them in the Republic, justice, you know, the, uh, and, all, and there too he talks about the good. And these are the, these are the principles that organize the soul of the human individual. And these are the, 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 it's the organization of the soul of the individual which gives you access to the principles of the universe. And he, this is where he divides this really up in terms of intelligibility and so on and so forth. So that's where the principles, of, that's what he's talking about. For Plato, the eternal ideas are things like the good, the soul. These are the principles. Not every, it's not as though everything, in the, everything has its own particular form, its own particular idea. Those are all organized by whatever principles we understand that organize the composition of the universe. So then you can have lower order ideas or lower order universals. But the real, the real universals for Plato are the organizing principles in the composition of the universe. And I think if you look at Plato's work as a body and overcome some of these things, like I said, Aristotle's interpretation, you look at the Parmenides the right way and you realize that he's, he's taken apart every idea of what a universal is that most people think he's talking about. So it's, it's a great irony. And the real approach that you get is you get in the Timaeus and the Republic where he's talking about a, a, a kind of hierarchy of ideas where you start from the, the composition of the universe, which is the good. But for the good, what's the good? If you look at the Parmenides, the good is a developmental principle, a principle of ongoing progress in the universe, in the creation of the universe. Now, from that standpoint, a universal is something that's understood from that standpoint. You discover the existence of a new principle as part of the composition of the organizing principles of the universe, what, what directs and develops the change in the universe. See, it's the same thing on this whole question of evolution. I mean, there is, in one sense, there's evolution. And, uh, there were, you could say, previously existing physical organisms to the existence of human beings. But what makes us human was not a development out of those previously existing physical organisms. It's rather that out of that development, an organism came into being which had certain underlying physical principles that allowed that organism to be coherent with the introduction of a new principle, which is reflected in creativity or cognition. That was a principle in the universe because the universe is developing. Otherwise, we couldn't exist. You know, there's a great truth in Dante where, you know, in a sense, we're great explorers of the universe. Human beings, our mission is to explore the universe. How do we explore the universe? We use our cognitive capabilities. What do we find in the universe? The universe unfolds to cognitive development, the developmental principles of the universe. Now, what did we come out of? We came out of those developmental principles. So what, in a sense, are we discovering? We're discovering the nature of the human mind. And in, in reality, we're discovering the physical principles that created the organism that we are that was appropriate to cognition. But we're discovering that about the universe as a whole. So there's a principle of organization, of composition in the universe. And you can call that the composer, you can call that God. It is a unique personality because it's one creative principle. So in a sense, we're the only creatures that really evolve. Everything else is a dead end. Everything else is doomed to extinction. 
You know, this comes up in, in Lynn's paper, The Skies Above, or what is it called? Man in the Skies Above. Because, look, any other creature, something is going to happen in the universe that's going to make it extinct. Climate change, uh, meteorites, supernovas, something. For most creatures, certain kinds of changes, you know, they're not going to over-survive it. What about human beings? We at least have the potential to survive anything in the universe. Because we can discern what the laws of the universe are that are going to cause these kinds of problems. So we at least have the potential. So we're a totally different species. Doesn't mean we have to disrespect other species. And it's fun to have them around. You know, if people give that as a reason, that would at least be a decent reason. There's nothing wrong with having them around. It gives you an idea of what was there, what kind of life forms there are, what kinds of things happen, what crazy things that they do. It makes it's fun. That's a good reason to keep them around. Even in, in it's even an argument to keep them around in in you know parks and wildernesses so that they you can see the way they operate on their own. That's all fine. But the idea that we keep them around because they have the same right to exist that we do. I mean, nature makes species extinct all the time. Why do we have to be encumbered with some rule that we, you know, we can't do anything to make them extinct? It's just nature. We're, you know, we come out of nature. See, the other point is, people either have to argue we don't come from nature, therefore we don't have a right to do these things, or nature made a big mistake, making us, and we go around doing these horrible things. Well, blame it on nature, don't blame it on me. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, remember the webcast tomorrow. I don't know how you guys are running that, but are we? Is everybody going to be here for that tomorrow? We're going to. We got some people coming. Yeah. We should invite people. We should get people Saturday. Yeah, we're showing it Saturday night. Okay. All right. Good. Oh, that's a good idea. Good. All right.